Well, the long-awaited news for WVU basketball has arrived. The West Virginia Mountaineers have a new basketball coach, the 23rd head coach in the history of WVU basketball is Darren DeVries, former Drake head coach, will now join the Mountaineers to take over a program coming off of the literal worst season in program history and a year that, let's face it, has been all about drama and losing. It's a dark time for the basketball program, but now potential greener pastures ahead. And Darren DeVries, who is a name that we're going to try to pronounce properly on our live reaction show right now as we try to digest this hire and this news here on a Sunday night and hopefully get better at the pronunciation as they move forward covering him. We'll see how our colleagues do. But Mike Oste, Ethan Bach here at WV Sports Now as we are talking West Virginia's new head basketball coach. The report came out. The program confirmed it. It is official. Ren Baker gets his guy as well. This is a man who's been to the NCAA tournament three times certainly recently, to say the very, very least, as they are now on the upswing at Drake with him. We'll see what they do without him. And 70-plus win percentage, 155 victories to this point. He's had success at a difficult place to win and to build a program at the mid-major level. This is not hiring a Hall of Famer, certainly not a Hall of Famer coming home like it was Bob Huggins 15 years ago, 15 or so years ago. This is not even John Beeline, who there were some connections, and even though he didn't have a Hall of Fame resume at the time, he might have made sense, and he became a Hall of Fame coach. This is a coach who is on the upswing, who maybe people didn't think initially would be the guy, but ends up being the guy, and Ren Baker gets his guy, and Darren DeVries is the head coach of the Mountaineers. So, Ethan, to jump right in, this is the guy. This is the guy that it felt like was going to be the guy, especially after the last couple days. The tea leaves could be red. We are able to pre-write some things. We were kind of getting confident that he would be the guy. It ends up being Darren DeVries. What are your initial thoughts on this hire before we fully unpack it? What immediately popped in your mind on this hire fit? Does it work? Do you like it? All of that. Yeah, I feel like when – the kind of the coaching carousel really kicked in this month. He had likes of Louisville, Ohio State, Michigan, Oklahoma State, et cetera, uh, fighting with West Virginia for for the best hires. And right. West Virginia kind of got lucky in a way, and they needed luck if they wanted the right hire. I mean, they were I haven't had to, much luck in yeah. the last year and a half, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. It it they were able to get their choice essentially, uh, realistically. Like Ohio State hired internally with interim head coach Jake Diebler, now full time head coach. Um, and then Michigan unexpectedly hiring Dusty May, uh, who seemed like he was going to go Louisville. Yeah. And Dries was, is, he's a Midwest guy. He would fit in the Big Ten. So you would think that Michigan would be targeting him as a mid major candidate. So West Virginia had some things go their way which ultimately ultimately uh, had them be able to choose between DeVries and Mark Bynes from James Madison. Now you do get DeVries instead of Bynes from James Madison, who many thought was going to be the guy from the jump. Obviously, Ren's been connected to him in the past. There were even rumors about him last summer after the Huggins scandal in West Virginia eventually landing on one year of interim of Josh Eilert. And maybe some could argue, okay, if you're comparing these two, yeah, DeVries has had such a great streak of success at a mid-major. And JMU and Drake, you could argue which one's a harder job, but maybe the cultural fit going from JMU to West Virginia would make more sense as a jump. So when it really felt like it was between these two because the other coaches have been hired or programs, the, the maybe the top programs a little bit above West Virginia, whether it's current or historic, we put it out there that to be realistic made their decisions. And as you put it, they didn't really, some of them didn't try to compete with the Mountaineers for the open spots. They either went with their guy another year of who was an interim at Indiana, kind of surprising. They didn't try to swing for the fences there. They just stayed the course disappointing season, but stayed the course Ohio state doesn't end up swinging for the fences really either. Michigan does. They get dusty may people thought maybe Ohio state, Indiana would be where he would end up. 
It almost felt like, too, that while Wen Baker and him have always been connected in the past year, that maybe that wouldn't work because he would jump. It would use WB as a stepping stone. Louisville, you would figure, is a better job than the Mountaineers, whether it's history or even now with the money and the prestige and what's happened there in the past, but maybe not. And then you land on DeRees. So when it became DeRees versus Bington, which one of those do you think was the better fit? Because some thought maybe DeRees the better coach, but not the better fit, but he ends up getting the job. Yeah, I think culturally, Byington's probably the better fit, but yeah, at, as of showing consistency at each program, I think DeRees has shown shown that uh, compared to Byington. Byington really hasn't had any bad seasons at Georgia Southern or James Madison, which are hard to win at. But this yeah. is like this was the first year where he was really on a national stage, uh, kind of similar to Dusty May last year. If they, if JMU went to the Final Four, he would have been that next mid-major darling, and he'll eventually be that. But I think with Dries is he was able to uh, just, even though he never really had a, he didn't have a 30 win season like Byington did this That's past year, but he, but he showed consistency. Right. He was able to get to the tournament three times, uh, get a win a couple years ago. Um, and just, he hasn't had, he hasn't had a season at Drake where he's not won 20 games. So there's consistency there. And plus he's, he had 18 seasons at Creighton under Dana Altman and Greg McDermott. So he has that he has that uh, high major just experience, and then to top it off with how he was able to uh, rebuild Drake after Nico Medved's one year there, and then turn it around into a consistent mid major program that's making the NCAA tournament. I think he's the better fit for what West Virginia needs to hire now as okay. a safe hire compared to Byington, who's had one really good year, but he hasn't shown consistency. Yeah, and you could argue maybe some would say maybe Byington's more of a cultural fit. And Rand Baker did say that would be something that he would look into and would be a factor for him. He doesn't want coaches to jump, dealt with that with the women's program, and then eventually now has Mark Kellogg, who's had success. But you could argue, as you're arguing here, that even if you feel Byington's a better cultural fit because of the areas he's been, maybe in the people and the recruiting base he's been in, in the part of the country he's been in, Maybe actually DeVries is more of a fit for what Ren Baker normally wants in a head coach, has said he'll want in a head coach, and what could lead the program to not insane to say, maybe crawl into the tournament next year, certainly two years from now. We'll get into all of that soon. Certainly bringing his son will help, and we'll certainly get into that as well here as we do have a lot of people with us here on our live reaction to West Virginia hiring Darren DeVries from Drake now a member of the West Virginia Mountaineers and the 23rd head coach of an historic program. Let's face it, coming off the worst season in program history, but an historic program nonetheless. We're going to go to some of our chat here, Ethan Buck, Mike Oste. Our full coverage right now also is over there at WV Sports Now, so feel free to read there, and we're going to have a lot more of this moving forward. The official introduction, as we're hearing right now, is Thursday at some point on Thursday. So I am interested to see how he's – how he schedules non-conference games for the next season and how many players he takes from the portal. I hope we can keep some of our guys from this WU team that is from BPA 1985 in the chat. Also, Matthew Tucker DeVries, as we said, get ready to learn WU basketball, buddy. That's part of this too. I mean, to be honest with you, Ethan, if you're sitting there last night and you're weighing two options, you did say, okay, Byington has a big 30-win season. You could make an argument Dusty May had one big major dominant season where they go to a Cinderella Final Four. Yeah, they're a tournament team this year, but get upset. But maybe Ren Baker's thinking, you guys worry about the big jump from what you did prior. I want consistency. So I'd rather have 20 years, 20 wins for five, you know, the hope is 20 years, but 20 wins for five years in a row and maybe not a 30-win season, but you could have a deep tournament run because just getting in, you could do it versus 17 wins, 24 wins, 30, then 23, then 18, more of a helter-skelter thing. So maybe that's what Ren's thinking, or maybe he just said to himself, this is a package deal. I get father and I get one year of son and the Mountaineer fan base doesn't want to wait two or three years. Like maybe in past eras, they won in the tournament next year off the worst season in program history. If I want to crawl in next year while we're building things, maybe I need the son. Maybe I need an NBA prospect with the coach. So I'll, I'll, this will be my 
tiebreaker scenario, that could have been something too. Um, it's never been easier to build a roster than it is now with the NAL portal. I fully endorse and expect competitive team next year. Curious if he retains any of our staff for recruiting purposes. So Ethan, I'm going to give you some of these before we get to the staff. And that's part of this too. Obviously the past staff under Eiler, they're, they're not coming back. They released their statements. You know, you can say what you want about it. We know some of them, they did a great job recruiting, but they're not going to be back. And it makes sense that a new coach is going to want his guys in there. And you wrote a little bit about this. Darren DeVries is somebody that has built up a program that was hard to win at. However, he did do it mostly through high school recruiting and started doing it before the transfer portal era. He has now dipped a little bit into the portal last couple years. It has allowed him to take a little bit of a, of a step up from where he was three or four years ago that might have happened anyway based on the success he's had there at Drake. What do you expect him to do now with the resources of the Mountaineers and what we know is in the NIL the exposure, the Big 12, the fan base, et cetera, the social media activity, because that's a thing too. In the portal, will he do more portal than in the past? Is he still going to live in the high school recruiting base, which I think would be probably a negative. I, I'd imagine Ren doesn't want that. Will he marry the two together? What do you expect out of him recruiting-wise now that he's going to be at West Virginia versus what he did at Drake? More of the same? Will he act differently? What can we expect there? Yeah, it, it was interesting to kind of track his years at Drake because when he took over the program, he had to go all portal basically at first. But then it slowly transitioned into a mix of high school and transfer portal recruiting. And and honestly, their portal recruiting wasn't anything crazy, especially yeah. not on paper like WVU in the in the past couple of years. But uh, just I, I'm I'm thinking it's going to be a balance between the two. Okay. I mean, obviously, this offseason, they're going to have to go portal. There's no question about that. It does help that he brings his son eventually over once he enters a portal and commits. But um, And it can help if he brings some of his Drake guys over as well. But he's going to have to go portal. You don't, you're going to have natural losses, I think, still with, with the current roster. I'm surprised nobody's entered the portal to this point, I think. Guys were in limbo waiting it out, yeah. um, which is still surprising because like Michigan, Louisville, Ohio, or not Ohio State, but Michigan, Louisville, especially Oklahoma State, yeah. they all they all had multiple uh, portal entries. So for West Virginia not to lose one single player is really impressive. <laughs> uh, it's it's very much an odd thing, and I, yeah, I don't I, I don't know what's going on. I, I think the wheels will start turning now that there's actually a coach in place, and some are going to leave. Yeah, yeah, some are going to leave. It's natural. It's not going to be, especially with Tucker figuring to come. Like, does Kirk yeah. Risha like Tucker taking his shots as an NBA prospect? You could argue that this maybe actually could convince them to leave, even if they like the coach. It's all about a fit. So that's true. We haven't seen yeah, anybody leave and I, yet. I think I think a lot of the roster is in a weird spot where they're they they're not good enough to play 30 minutes a game in Big 12 basketball, but right. they have a spot on the bench that they could be productive. But if they want to play more, they could easily transfer down and play 30 sure. minutes a game in a mid-major conference. I think a lot but of the they they did agree. Now go back to Huggins recruiting a lot of these kids. They initially agreed to play under Huggins, some of them as bench players at West Virginia, mm -hmm. thinking they could go literally go to the Final Four, win a national title. They ended up having to start on a really bad team that is literally arguably the worst team in program history. They might have had fun, but obviously that's not what they initially bought in. Some stayed, and obviously Trey Mitchell and others that were there before decided to go, and that's the end of their college career. So... It'll be interesting what decision they make off of that because you're saying they could play down, they they could play down and get more minutes, and maybe that's better for their career. We get it, but they did just previously agree to to be at West Virginia prior to the scandals, thinking they might not start. So if they do leave now with more eligibility left, and now a new coach who's permanently in place who's had success, that would then probably scream to me that they initially agree to do that just for Huggins. And again, yeah, I don't want to make yeah. this show about Huggins, but that 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 would then probably say that they were willing to do it for a Hall of Famer, but they might not be willing to do it for anybody else. And then they would want minutes separate from tournament or not. 
in, unless Huggins or a coach like him is involved. Because, again, um, you know, that was just for his resume. They might have agreed to do that then. That's well, the only difference I could see now. Well, also, these guys have just been through so much the last oh, well, calendar year. Yeah, that it could just be it just they could might they might just want to change the scenery. So yeah, I just yeah. think a lot of these guys are in a spot where they could transfer down or they could stay at West Virginia, compete for minutes. But either way, Dereese is gonna have to go through the portal uh this offseason, uh, no matter how many players they lose. And then I think it's then they have to slowly transition starting this summer into long term recruiting through high school. Uh, building relationships. They have a signee for 2024 from Josh Eilert's staff and Carmelo Atkins. So yeah, they can have at least a start and then kind of turn that into 2025, 2026. And would he fit Darren DeVries' teams at Drake? Or now do you expect him? Because he even told us directly he wanted to see who the coach was. Now that we know the coach, do you think he fits, or is this now probably a red flag that he maybe would decommit or not want to be there anymore at all since he's he's the signee? It it, it sounds like Darius had uh, contact with him early in his high school right. career, so there's at least a connection there. Okay, I, I think I, I think for I think for Mello, it's I it's so late into his it's so late into the recruiting cycle that it would hurt him. Know. Yeah, you yeah. never know what's gonna what what team's gonna be open with the spot, especially with the portal now. Um, so he might. He said he knew he was gonna have to roll the dice with Josh Eiler. He knew he knew when he committed and signed. He knew the staff might not be here this year. And now they're yeah, not. That was, so that was one hell of a gamble. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's a hell of a gamble, and I think he's gonna take it. I I, I would be shocked. It's not a bad play. Like I, I could no. see if I'm him, and. I don't know, all these names thrown out there and they didn't get any of them or they landed on a coach from D3 or Calhoun, for example, nothing against him, but it wouldn't carry the cachet. Then I could see, okay, I'm a top recruit. They're not acting like they're big time, even though they're a big brand with history. But this again is the guy that Ren Baker, it's not a secret. He's been interested in DeVries for a long time. He's been on everyone's board. So nobody in media can really argue I'm the only one who had this guy. Everyone's been bringing him up no matter where you ranked him. And yeah, Byington was another one that was brought up, but it ends up being Darren DeVries and the track record from Drake track record recently is a thing too. We're talking this season, the year prior, this isn't like success five years ago when we're trying to reboot things, which honestly was, yeah, Huggins had a nice run at Kansas state there. They were competitive, but kind of was what that was. And he came back and had success right away. This is different. This is not bringing a hall of famer home. This is bringing a young coach in who we're talking the WVU angle on how this will help the WVU program. What this means, the impact for the WVU program. You could also say that for him, this makes sense. Like who knows if this will be where he'll be forever. And, and Jay Wright did say on the broadcast that he knows him a little bit. He thinks the cultural fits there. He thinks he's going to win there. And he does think his personality might be interested in staying at West Virginia for a decade. He does not see him as a guy who's going to jump job to job every year, which I think Ren Baker may have liked as well if he thought the others, like a Dusty May, is going to job job jump. I don't think he'd want that. But this feels like the next progression. Drake to WVU, Big 12, see how it goes. And yeah, if you go to a Final Four WVU in your first few years like Huggins, then I'm sure... Indiana, etc., will call you, but that's a good problem. I think West Virginia want to, wants to have at that point, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna go a little bit more back into the chat here because we do have a lot of activity here on a live first live we've done here in a while. And again, WV Sports now for all of our full written coverage to this point. Um, do you have any? I guess we'll go through right now because nobody has hit the portal yet. By the time you watch this, you might have had players already decide to leave, but we'll do this here as a live reaction show. We're talking how Darren DeVries and his track record impacts the Mountaineers and this making sense. We just talked a little bit about players haven't yet to jump to the portal and what could happen. And we also will get to Tucker DeVries joining him and the impact of that here in a moment. Kirk Kreisha, the players on this roster that maybe could come back that have yet to go to the portal yet, but certainly could jump at any moment. Who do you think off of somebody who tracks this and covers this? 
would make sense to leave just on who either who you're talking to, what you're hearing, how they would fit in now with the Darren DeVries team that is likely going to get a lot of looks for his son, Tucker, with one year left and looking at the NBA. Who do you think stays? Who do you think goes? What would you even recommend on this current roster of players that could come back? Yeah, I mean, we talked about it earlier. I think there's a whole group of Seth Wilson, Josiah Harris, Ofri Neve, Jeremiah Bembry, Pat Sumanik. There, that's the group of five right there that have that decision to make. Can they? Do they want to stay here, compete for minutes, or transfer down and yeah. and uh, get more get more playing time? Um, Kirk Kreese is a name where I'm not going to speculate he's going to enter the portal, but it's just. To me, it's natural for uh, just with everything going on. Like, clearly, he was close to Bob Huggins. Uh, yeah, clearly. And with Hugs, especially potentially coaching next year, um, depending where sure. he's at, maybe sure. Kerr follows him. I think. I think also could be a job that's beneath Kerr, though. I mean, to be fair, Kerr, and that's no. Yeah. I'm not trying to throw shade at Huggins or Kirk yeah. Risha, but if, if Huggins gets a job at a mid-major, which Rick Pitino had to do to get back into things at Iona, if he's, for example, at Iona and that equivalent, does Kirk Risha finish out his college career at that level mm-hmm. where you're really, you know what I mean? Like that, yeah. he would have to really take a ding for to do a favor for Huggins. He may do it, but that'll be a conversation. And honestly, knowing Huggins like we do in his resume. Huggins may tell him, look, kid, you're above this. Like, I'm going to correct my career now, but you need to worry about yourself. So that he may go with Huggins. Huggins got to get hired first, of course. But it it might be that wherever Huggins gets hired doesn't make sense for him. Yeah. And And then maybe he goes back to West Virginia at that point. If Huggins says you're too good for this, maybe he goes back to WU. I mean, it could be. And I I think Kerr actually would fit under DeRee's offense and just just their style of play. Um, Yeah. I think just with how they run sets and how they they have a lot of just people running around, it's not like a standstill motion offense at the same time though. It's not, it's not one of the fast paced tempo teams in the country, but it's still, okay. but nobody's just standing still on offense and set motion. (laughs) People are moving around. So I think Kerr would thrive under Dere's offense, but at the same time, just with how he got WVU, he, yeah, clearly hugs was a huge part of it, and he stuck around with Josh Eiler. He, that's the thing with Kerr. He re-entered the portal after Hugs resigned. He did. So yeah, people that's don't where, remember that. That's yes. where it's like, does he test the waters again? And I honestly, you I could think test the waters time, and choose to come back yeah. again. I mean, that is a thing that could happen. People, yeah, I think that's what people forget. You you can yeah. enter the portal and exit. You, just because you enter the portal doesn't mean you're officially gone. Most yeah, likely, that, yeah, it's ninety nine percent the guys are gone. But sure. there's always that one percent chance, like a Kirk Kreese or Jose Perez. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> West Virginia experienced two. What was yeah. there like four in the nation, and West Virginia got two of them last year, uh, technically. Yeah. So like it it can happen. As weird as the as that is for the Mountaineers, yeah, Ethan Bach, Mike Osti here. Our live reaction to the Mountaineers hiring Darren DeVries, the 23rd head coach in the history of the basketball program, taking over a team. On the heels of the worst season in program history and tons of drama over the last year, taking over technically for an interim in Josh Eiler, but of course he'll always be remembered as the guy who took over for Bob Huggins and the legacy that he left, whether you like him or not, a successful tenure, the most successful tenure really in program history for how long of success and sustained success he had, but kind of got stale there in the last five years. They did get in the tournament in his final season, but as a high seed, you're crawling in because of analytics, Failing to get to 20 wins, which again, Darren DeVries is clipping off 20 win seasons. So, Ren also probably, he wouldn't have done this if it wasn't for two scandals. They did try to retain Huggins after the first one. But now that they had to move on and we're not going to bring Huggins back, it's clearly looking to get some wins, not just rely on analytics, even though Ren's an analytic guy. They want to try to get in the tournament, solidify themselves there year after year like they should be, get a seed range anywhere from, of course, one is the dream, but at least even be in the top six seed line. And if you're there, you have a chance to get a deep run outside of a crazy Cinderella story here. You could even do a Clemson thing. Like that could be a a reality. But generally speaking, 10 or above, it's a wild Cinderella thing to get to the Final Four, maybe a Sweet 16 for you, but the program wants more than Sweet 16s. 
There were even some that were, were kind of tired on Huggins three out of four. So he's seen runs. They wanted more than that. So now we'll see what the Darren DeVries era is going to be more from the chat here. And Ethan, you touched on this a little bit, but Owen Jared wants to know what actually is, and it's a fair question now. I'm sure not everyone follows Drake basketball. What actually is Darren DeVries' coaching style? What mm -hmm. does he bring to the table? What type of team will Mountaineer fans be watching? And it does sound like, for better or worse, an entertaining team and a more entertaining team than what we've been watching the last year or so. But does that work in the Big 12? Will he have to change? Is that system going to translate? What kind of players maybe is he going to look for based on his style? Things like that. Yeah, so we'll talk positives and negatives because I feel like when a coach is hired, everybody hits the positives of, yeah. of the hire. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, his three style, they played so well in transition. They're not like, like I said, they're not necessarily the, the fastest team in the country. They're about middle of the pack, 150th in the country in tempo. But okay, they just, they take a lot of efficient shots. You're going to see a lot of smart shots. I think it's going to be a lot of threes, layups. If it's a mid-range shot, it's going to be wide open. I don't think it's going to be contested fadeaways from 15 feet out. Um, and then on the defensive side, he plays 99% man-to-man. It's going to be like hugs where it's it's a lot of man. Um, you're, you're not going to see much zone at all. Uh, and and I think it's interesting. Here's, here's the negative for me with the way Rem Baker emphasized defense. He made it sound yeah. like he was trying to get a – of like a Tony Bennett type elite. Right. Player. Which would not be entertaining, but yeah. did win. Yeah. It made, it made it sound like it, I don't care how we play as long as we win. Well, um, but in reality, then AD would probably feel that way though, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. He should, but just the reason probably he's, he's not the greatest defensive coach that they, that they pulled from, but his sure. offense is very efficient. Like it's, it's top it's 99 percentile and efficiency the transition is up there as well um it's not elite but it's very good so i think you're going to see a fun offense but in at the same time i think you could see defensive struggles they allowed 70 points a game but they scored 80 points a game so it, i think you're going to see some high scoring basketball but he's had he's had his occasional couple yeah, good seasons yeah. defensively now what that immediately screams to me is it'll be fun, entertaining to watch. You'll win some games you're not supposed to win, but you're probably going to lose some games you're thinking maybe you wouldn't lose because you're going to have defensive lapses. And that style, this might even go back to John Beeline a little bit if you wanna, really want to connect to history. And this might even connect to maybe the Kevin Pitsnoggle era. That went to an Elite Eight, a Sweet 16. That was very successful but that era, and that's even before my college days, by the way, but just knowing that era, that was kind of hard attack city because that was an era that you can really sneak up on some teams, but you also can lose. It's going to be entertaining. That was a lot of three-point shots. You know, That was an era where there wasn't as many threes. We'll see now uh, what DeVries does at West Virginia where there's a lot more threes, at least in the basketball world. Do you agree with that kind of assessment just off the top? And then – if that is the case, is that a recipe? I'm going to throw it out there. And I know the program, I've been the proponent of this. They should properly go back to history and claim what, what needs to be claimed. But they have claimed a national championship from that 42 NIT title. They got number one rank in a major poll. They got it. It was the better tournament in, the, in that period of time. So the banner says national champs. It's out there. The NCAA approved it. However, they want to win a legit one. And... Ren Baker wants to win a national championship. He really, really does. Uh, he said it publicly. He said it privately. He's not doing this to go to go to a Final Four and feel like that's the ceiling, and that kind of was the vibe when Huggins got there. That was celebrated as if it was a national title because that's an incredible ceiling to get to. Does this DeVries style win national championships, or is there a ceiling there? Because it almost sounds like if the descent has a bad day, He's losing 99-98 in a Elite Eight game, and that's just live or die. That's just how it's going to be. But it, it seems like it's a little maybe nerve-wracking if you're looking to really go the distance. Yeah, I, I think it's hard to – I think it's hard to exactly compare it to B-line. 
Um, I, the yeah, reason sure. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I get the comparison. Uh, I think just when you look at how their how Drake's offense and defense has been through the last six years, it's it's very sporadic. Like they've had some really average right. offensive and defensive seasons, <laughs> but then sometimes they've been ranked in the top fifty defense uh, one okay. or two seasons. So they have their <laughs> They have their stretches. Um, and That's what I mean. Like, when does the stretch come? This yeah. is like you're almost making me a little bit more nervous about how far they can go. I like the higher. But, like, I'm just saying that it almost feels like this could be, I don't know, one of those. Like, it almost feels like it's concerning for March, I guess. If you're figuring you're going to be in March all the time, even it might be fine for the Big 12 play where it's, it's physical basketball. It might be concerning for a March run. That's yeah, the concern. I, I could see the concern, but I, and I agree with Ren that defense defense wins in college basketball now. Yeah, um, and you obviously still need you still need a good offense, but the way DeReeves has his just setups, like it's a lot of it's a lot of three guard, four guard type lineups, okay. and that wins now in college basketball. And like I said earlier, yeah. they take efficient shots. So a lot of them are – it's either a three or it's a layup. It's not okay. a lot of mid-range shots. So I think when you have this, the the three, four guard lineups in March and you get hot at the right time, especially if you're that Cinderella, if you get like Oakland or uh, even Duquesne winning a game in the tournament, when, when, you, when you get into the tournament at, at just a hot rate over the last week of basketball and you're playing good basketball – and then everybody's hitting their shots. I think I, I think that's all out the window, and you can you can make a run through your offense, but you still need good defense. Yeah, and and also he's coming from mid major program, but Drake did beat tournament teams the last few years, so he does have wins over tournament teams. Oakland actually is one of them. You did mention the the lost UAB, which would be one of those losses that I think I'm kind of concerned about, which I'm alluding to that you could be the better team, have the better resume, but his style could get nipped in March, but maybe not. And anybody could get nipped in March. So it is hard to coach and just hire somebody off of three weeks when you got to get there in the first place. And again, they're coming off of the worst season in program history. And also saying the efficiency is there. Ren Baker, again, is a very analytic guy. I've seen him. He has tons of spreadsheets all over the place. So he even does schedules that way. It's not just for show. He probably looked at all of that. He probably played the analytic game. He probably is trying to project it to the Big 12. I, I, I guarantee he did all of that. I mean, yeah, they wanted to hire before the Final Four. This is well before that. This is after some other programs, even though they kind of got lucky, were other programs that maybe were ranked higher than WVU based on who's the top program open, decided to go in other directions. Who knows where they would have been if, if Indiana Ohio State said, let's play ball. May, who knows? Maybe one of them might get DeVries. Like he was a darling out there that the, these programs and many reports say he even had options. So going further more into the chat here. Um, so number one, Matthew Swanson is bringing up that his average, and I didn't do this math myself. I'm going to go off with Matthew saying here, his average height of his lineups the last several years is six, three, which would imply like small ball. You need small ball in a way because this is an offensive era, you need guard play to win. Teams without guard play are not going to go far in March. And this is a little different than even years ago where I was in Pittsburgh covering tournament games. Three overtime games are, are not even getting into 100 points. So you, you don't have the winner getting there. So defense is still part of this. But there were some teams, part of the Huggins slide those last five years, that didn't have enough rebounding. Eilert certainly didn't have any rebounding. That was the West Virginia problem the last two or three years, especially even the tournament year. It sounds like that could be a problem again if he brings the same style, especially now to the major conference level in the Big 12. So I like the higher, I like the fit, but if you want to go a negative direction again, to be fair here, is there a concern of the size he's going to bring? If there can be enough rebounding there to at least get a high enough seed in the Big 12 before you get to the tournament where then it's more guard play. Is that accurate for you for many of the games you watched of him coaching Drake? And is that maybe an area that he could maybe change and say, okay, I'm a guard guy in the mid-major level, but I got to get a big here. I got to flirt with seven foot for one player at least on this team that he maybe didn't recruit before. Yeah, like I said earlier, it's a lot of three, four guard lineups. And I think in the Big 12, like just the style, you can't – I don't think you can go – 
an average height of six three with uh four guards maybe if maybe if he had maybe if you count uh his son at six you think seven. that's correct by the way i'm just giving matthew the benefit of the doubt he, he does he plays he plays <laughs> he plays a lot of he, i don't okay. i honestly wouldn't doubt that he plays a lot of a yeah. lot of guard ball um but i think in big 12 basketball you need physicality that's uh, what i mean all right you need size. You need yeah. you need you need guys that that could, especially at the five. You need guys that could look like they could play tight end in the NFL. That, that's not the John Rothstein tweet. Like that's gonna, we're yeah. gonna need a new logo and a new saying on the shirt <laughs> after games if they win. If that's a six three team and that's the tallest guy and they're all lanky guards, it's not tougher than a long than a long weekend at your in laws. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I, I think I think they that style definitely works in March. Like I said, playing okay playing with a lot of guards and spreading yeah. out the floor and taking efficient shots. It works in March and big 12 play. They, they, they could struggle with, like you said, rebounding defense physicality. But if you go, I think you can pass that with a three guard lineup as long as, as long as the four is a stretch four and then can also play defensive interior. I think it could sure. work. They're, yeah, they're and, and- find, find this to work. Sure, and Anthony Perry here to give a shout out. He actually compared a possible DeVries strategy off of kind of what I'm saying to mirror what Baylor did to win a very surprising national championship with three guards, a big, and then a stretch four that was kind of a tweener in the middle there. And they just banged him and maybe had three guys take all the shots and the rest of them just played physical. That could be a strategy that maybe could lead to success, but I think that is the issue. If he recruits the exact same way, it is a strategy to win in March, but you got to get there first. And as much as getting in is a thing, cause it's March madness. I'm sure Ren has also played the projections out there. There's still a seed line of a ceiling in terms of winning natties. Like you don't want to be a nine, a 10, a 12 seed every year. And then say, well, big 12 is not our style, but we're great for March because we got the guards they do want to get a relatively solid seed to get there and get a good setup and a good path. So yeah. you don't want to drop big 12 games and say, we'll get him in March. That cannot be the situation every year. I can already see Mountaineer fans getting sick of that. If that's going to be the thing. So that'll hold you back from deep runs. That'll, that'll get you in the tournament, but three tournament appearances in four or five years is fantastic. A Drake, fantastic. A Drake, three tournament appearances in five years, Good at West Virginia, not bad. Probably wouldn't get fired depending on how far they go in the tournaments. Maybe you need more than three out of five, but no one's hanging. I mean, that's not going to be a giant banner. That's not. I mean, that that's going to be a little small thing. Maybe thrown on the big banner that has the years. That's not going to separate when you're looking at Huggins and Beeline. He's going to need to make at least one run. He's probably going to. I think some fans here. You've been bringing this up a lot too. You're mentioning Big Twelve style. Forget March. I think the fans fairly want to make a run in the Big 12 tournament one of these next couple of years. I understand you got to rebuild and you got to transfer portal and you can't you probably cannot fairly expect them to go ahead and win a conference title next year. That would be unreasonable. But in the next three years, and he will get the time here. I'm sure knowing Ren, he will get the time. Look at what he did with Neil Brown giving him more time. I would say three years from now that they, they got to at least win two or three conference tournament games and see what happens from then on. I mean, that was the hit on Huggins, that even if you're getting in because of analytics and the world likes you, the basketball community, at least prior to the scandals, I don't I don't think everyone wants to live off of analytics and have 19 wins and have a hard time on social media against opposing fans, but you're in the tournament and you can add another year to the historic record. Like, you got 31, Pitt has 27, but you're doing it off analytics. The fans want to win games. Like, to be fair, yeah. like, can you, can you win games – and can you win road games in the Big 12? Can you win rivalry games? Can you beat Kansas outside of just in Morgantown? Can you make a run in the Big 12 tournament? Like, if Iowa State can, you can. If you're looking at the history and the money of the program. So I don't want to hear that it's impossible because you're West Virginia. These are small markets that do not have the history of the Mountaineer program and do not have the money that are doing it. Baylor won a national championship. I mean, no one would have predicted that 10 years ago. So that those things are are, are part of this, too, here. Ethan Bach, Mike Osti, or WV Sports now. Live reaction to the Mountaineers hiring Darren DeVries from Drake, 23rd head coach in Mountaineer basketball history, and, of course, replacing the one-year interim of Eilert, Huggins, and Pryor Beeline. So two Hall of Famers in the midst there. 
with an interim. There will be expectations, even though you got to temper him and give him some time here. Okay, going back to the chat, and this goes Paul H. here. we got to be competitive in the Big 12, obviously, especially play defense. Drake has been a big guy who can also possibly break. Drake has a big guy who can also possibly transfer that's realistic in addition to Tucker. Thoughts on anybody else on the Drake roster besides his son? His son is slam dunk going to come. That makes sense. You're just going through the motions there. Okay. But when you see a coach go to a school, especially in this era with the portal, you usually see two or three players come. Look at Mark Kellogg going from Stephen F. Austin to West Virginia, what he did there. If they want in the tournament next year and want to make a Big 12 run, yeah, they're going to go in the portal, but maybe they just go raid his team that was a tournament team. Like, Are there other players there that you think can step up and play Big 12 basketball? Yeah, I, the, the, the biggest – I talked about this a little bit and just – uh, the analysis of what he's done at Drake. Uh, I talked a little about a little bit about the high school recruiting. Kevin Overton is a freshman at Drake, and he averaged 11 points, three rebounds. He's six foot five guard. He's not uh, he's not the big that we were talking about, but right that but that would be like having. I think that's been a problem with West Virginia the last two seasons. Is, it also seems here the big doesn't have eligibility left, is what the rest of the chat is saying now. I didn't look exactly who he was talking about, but he's alluding to a big. You got to look at the eligibility too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with West Virginia, it would be huge for Dries to get a, a freshman transfer who has three years of eligibility. I think West Virginia recruited the transfer portal really well, but if there was any criticism I'd give, it's it's all those guys were either fifth year seniors or traditional yeah. seniors. Right. Uh, it was rarely a freshman transfer, sophomore transfer who had multiple years of eligibility. So to be able to get like a foundation, and that's what Ren Baker talked about is building that program kind of similar to the Neil Brown template, even though if it'll take a little <laughs> bit, but, but just having, being able to get. Don't ruin the transfer. vibe. I got going in yeah, the chat yeah. right now. Don't ruin the vibe with me for <laughs> five year yeah. journey. I like Neil Brown, but I don't think the fans would want to go through that. Yeah. But just <laughs> getting getting freshman transfers, sophomore transfers, that yeah. at least helps substitute West Virginia not recruiting high school as much as they used to, sure. especially at towards the end of the tw- 2010s with Huggins. Yeah, 100%. I mean, you can't – it doesn't matter where you are, unless maybe you're at Drake. You can't live just recruiting high school. Now, if you're Drake, or even if you're Creighton and you're vying for a national championship and you're looking to get further than an Elite Eight, and you're a mid-major, though, and you have disadvantages of being a mid-major, you might have to rely on having a top high school recruit build himself up and then two years later can do what now Creighton's doing now, and you mix in some transfers that see the program doing well and, okay, I can get some shots there and have success there. That's one thing. But when you are a major program, you can't live with high school recruiting. And to Neil Brown's credit, actually, because, yes, he continuously keeps saying that he is a developmental coach and they got to go to high school recruits like Rodney Gallagher, things like that are going to save the program. In the midst, you know, the same year he brought in Rodney Gallagher, he brought in the 13th consensus All-American in football in the football program history off of a multiple time transfer that came from the Big Ten after prior being a, a group of five guy in Beanie Bishop so those guys are key too and you have less players to deal with obviously on the basketball court so those are going to be key as well but yeah I would think that and honestly Calipari even alluded to this a little bit even though he said he probably can't change at this point in his career we are seeing teams win off the transfer portal and you cannot live in high school recruiting that's true but we also are seeing teams that have been a- together and been around each other for more than one year and have some chemistry beating off the teams that have seven portal players or have an entire roster of NBA draft picks. We just saw an insurance salesman beat an NBA roster. And why? Now, he was an ad off a of transfer, but everybody else, Townsend and company at Oakland, they had played together for three, four years and had a gelling chemistry that he then fit right in, whereas... Coach Cal, it's it's different every year. You know, Trey Mitchell came aboard, but he wasn't there the year before. So the entire roster hadn't played together prior. That did get West Virginia in the tournament again when, let's be honest, 
Huggins was facing pressure to get back there and basically threw darts at the wall and said, I, you know, chemistry might not work. Maybe this doesn't win a natty, but I got to get in this tournament. So if it's all fifth year seniors, we'll get in the tournament. And, and that's what happened a couple years ago. But to go far in the tournament or to do that forever, he already was older at that point. It wasn't like Huggins was going to coach for 20 years. DeVries at his age could be there for 10 plus years. You can't do all one year of eligibility, the whole starting five, even into the bench, six, seven players, all one year left only. I mean, and let's also be honest. Let's try to look into their, you know, to be fair, let's try to look in their situations. I love helping kids, Ethan. I'm sure you do too. I don't think it's best for business to bring in three guys that are controversially fighting the NCA and you know about it. I mean, look, like, I mean, is that good? Like, you're, you you took L's all across the board. Maybe you won the battle situation, but it didn't matter at that point. Like, you took the suspension from Cresha. Arizona didn't have to face the suspension. Jose Perez never played a damn game for you. Battle, you kind of won, but your season was over at that point, and he missed games because you're fighting. You don't need to do all that. You're trying to, if you're trying to win a championship, you know, this isn't, you're, are you winning a political election or are you trying to win a championship? Because, Maybe you did some history, but it didn't help you on the court here. Um, Kevin Overton is a solid freshman. That's a name. That's a player that Anthony's thrown out there to possibly bring in. Yeah, I think they do need to bring in younger players. They need they need one. That would be how you know the program really seriously can contend for another Final Four national title is if they can land, like you're saying, a portal addition, not a high school recruit, but a portal addition who has at least one year of college basketball experience, but at least two or three years left of eligibility for whatever reason. They get that kid, that then could open up the floodgates to more than just the Eric Stevensons of the world. Yeah, it, I, I think I think you, you you were right on about with Kentucky and Cal. They, they don't know, especially after the one-and-done era ended, they've been in this weird spot of they're still trying to go one-and-done with certain yeah. freshmen – but then they're trying to fill out the rest of the roster with like fifth year grad transfers. Like, yeah, as, as he was saying that, I actually turned to my colleague and was like, this is actually the oldest Kentucky team they've had in 15 years. So if he's saying they always do it very, very young, this was an older Kentucky team, even though they had some NBA players there. But yeah, yeah that's I, not even enough, really. Yeah. I think, I think you have to look at teams like UConn for an example, or uh, even the Baylor team mentioned a couple years ago that won the national championship. Like right. getting right. transfers is fine, obviously, and getting grad transfers is fine. Vet, vets win in college basketball now. It's yeah. not, it's not, it's not the one and done era anymore. Veterans right. win in college basketball, but UConn, for an example, is fa- is fit the system perfectly with Dan Hurley. You get transfers that have multiple years, and then you keep that core together. So you're, so those guys are playing two to three years with each other. Multiple and you're years. not, yeah. and you're not, yeah, and you're not retooling the roster every single off season, right. even though what they, the players West Virginia brought in were really talented. They were, they beat yeah. some of the best teams in the country for Jesse Edwards, Raekwon Bauer. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think it's just hard. I, I think it's just hard and draining for a coaching staff to do that every single spring and summer. Yeah, because even if you didn't have the scandals and Huggins was coach and he still was coach, you'd be doing the same thing in the portal right now. Even if it was Huggins who just had a tournament year, for example, and you had no scandals, you would lose eligibility of most of those players. Kirk Kreisha, you'd be talking to, and probably he'd be a slam dunk comeback if it's for Huggins. But outside of that, it would be we're dipping in, you don't know, the roster. And doing that every year, like, I think a lot of Mountaineer fans would have loved to see the team a couple years ago that got in the tournament, that got them winning again with Eric Stevens. Eric Stevenson even said himself, he wishes he was there more and he had more eligibility. I mean, the guy's playing for Best Virginia, he's throwing out first pitches. He's in Morgantown all the freaking time, even though he's pursuing the NBA. He wishes he had more time there. But I think the fans wish they could see that team again. Because that team, what was a 10 seed, and they lost to a Maryland in a similar program. They got, you know, they were in the game for a while and then kind of got blown out at the end. If that same team had another year left, you figure then they're, you know, a four seed. And then who knows? Like that. And, and you even had better. guys, you even had guys from that team want to come back, like Trey Mitchell, right. Joe Tucson. They came they back. Did, yeah. 
they were until, coming back for fire to until hugs yeah. until hugs screwed up so right like that team that team the the way it was built was fine you had you had a <laughs> mix of guys that had more yeah they had two years of eligibility they weren't two all is okay two is yeah, okay, two's okay. <laughs> yeah but it, it's it, it just hugs ruined it when it with, is, with it everything is. last summer you had the opportunity to bring to retain trey mitchell joe toussaint bring guys back from last year's season who made the ncaa tournament yeah. and mix that with a great transfer portal class like yeah it they had a formula down and it was going it probably was going to work they were probably going to make the ncaa tournament they were probably going to get national talk with how good their roster was. that's why and people were what if here yeah, that was why Andy Katz and those guys prior to the scandals was saying West Virginia is a dark horse Final Four team. It sounded crazy because obviously they haven't been there since 2010 and they had the Sweet 16 run, but that seemed like the ceiling for the more modern WVU. But it was because of what you're saying. It was sprinkling a couple legit transfers that they were beating out Blue Bloods for with a team that was just in the tournament. <laughs> and, and moving some of those players agreeing to move down in the pecking order, thinking they were going for a natty. Like that was real life in February and March. And then we know the story. So now it's the future of the program here with Darren DeVries here, even Bach, my gosh, here, WV sports. Now our instant reaction, our live broadcast here of the Mountaineers hiring Darren DeVries from Drake. And he was Ren's guy. He is Ren's guy. And it's not Byington. It's not any of the other names. It's not Dusty May, but that probably was never realistic. It's not Andy Kennedy. It's not Calhoun. It's Darren DeVries. This is a young up-and-coming coach that's had success, has won a lot of games. It's not about someone from West Virginia. It's about a coach who's winning and is hungry and fits this job. And this is the next progression in his career. And if he takes him on a Final Four run and then leaves in six years for a Blue Blood, I don't think the fan base is going to be too mad because that is a life of sports these days. It is big business, but you want to have the success while he's there. And it also feels like at least a few years of a journey that he's willing to stay there for. If you look at the contract and all of that and what Ren said. So we will see more chat activity here. Okay. Yeah, this is fair to bring up here and this is BPA again, but again, it's, I will admit this goes back to what Ethan and I are talking about seed wise winning enough in the Big 12, being in the Big 12, which is why he's taking this job versus being at a mid-major. And yeah, you can have Cinderella stories of Oakland, et cetera. It's very, very hard, even FAU going going as far as they did. It's very, very hard as a mid-major. So BPA brings up, is it style? What is the reason that Darren DeVries has been consistently in the NCAA tournament but has not been able to win a tournament game and has actually been upset to this point with a mid-major? Why is that? Is that a concern? Well, I think depending on who you ask, he does have an NCAA tournament win. If you want to count it, they okay. during the during the COVID or during the bubble tournament, they they won the play-in game, which usually would have been in Dayton. If you want to count that, you can count it. But I, I see the was point. that when they officially count because they officially started counting those as NCAA tournament victories. Like Pitt actually counted one two years ago, but wasn't that like three years ago when they officially started counting those? Yeah, they would. Before? It was around then. I'm not sure if Drake actually has that counted. Because I don't think like Andy Katz would say he doesn't have one yet if he if he yeah. actually had one from the play-in. So it probably doesn't count. But, but I, I, I but I see the point. I, I see yeah. the point. Um, I, I mean, he played Miami, Florida last year, who made the Final Four. Right. I mean, this year he played a Washington State team, which they had way less talent. Kyle Smith did a hell of a job there this season. They had no business making the NCAA tournament. Any coach that wins at Washington State deserves to have a really good job because it's impossible to win there. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, and, I, and, I, and yeah. I thought Drake on I thought Drake if they got past Washington State, which they had the, they the, they had the chance to win that game. Like going down the stretch, they could have closed sure. the game out. Sure. Um, I thought I thought potentially they they could be a ten over two upset and beat Iowa State and go to the Sweet Sixteen. Did you and do honestly, it on your bracket? I didn't. I didn't look at your bracket yet. I, I, I did have Drake over Iowa State. Okay. I just thought, <laughs> the style, okay. I thought okay. the style of play. I thought Iowa State. Iowa State sometimes they look great at times, but then other yeah, times yeah. they they, uh, they, look, yeah. they play down. I considered uh, it too. Actually, I don't think I did it though. But 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 okay. with. But with uh, and I, it worked out for West Virginia. If, if Drake made the Speed 16, we'd still oh, yeah. be sitting here without a coach. So, yeah. um, but I think Drake, I mean, Drake's played good teams, um, in the NCAA tournament and they're not expected to win. 
they have favorable seeds. Like they're getting 10 seeds, 11 seeds. Um, so yeah, they're, th- those are seeds that you can make a Cinderella run with. Um, I, I, th- I guess it is concerning that his style can't, hasn't been able to actually win around the 64 game, but right. We're not talking about getting to a sweet 16, like winning one in five years. Like if he doesn't win, if he gets it, that's why I said before, if he's getting in the tournament year after year with West Virginia, but not winning a tournament game. I mean, that's like the end of Huggins that people were kind of sick of, even though they, they might've loved hugs before the scandals. I don't think that's what Ren wants. I don't think that's what the fan base wants. And, and I do think that if it's five years from now and Aaron DeVries has not won an NCAA tournament game, Ren could fire him. Like, I don't think Ren's playing around here. Like, we're, we're, this is different than when they hired Beeline. I think Ren has a sense of urgency, even though he understands you got to rebuild. So it also may require Darren DeVries to change up some things. And I think this goes back to what seed you get. As you mentioned, if you are Drake and you are a 10 seed, that's probably the ceiling. He's usually a 10, 11, 12, 13 at the worst. At West Virginia, in the Big 12, and might, he might have a mulligan next year because you're rebuilding, but with the portal, et cetera, the 10 seed was because of analytics and they didn't even win 20 games. They almost threw him in as a 10 seed to be nice to hugs because of analytics and they are playing a really, really tough schedule. That's an anomaly year. You got to figure to get in. You got to get 20 wins. And if you're West Virginia to have a chance based on where you're going to be seed wise, you got to, you really got to figure like a seven seed is a bad seeding for a program like WVU. Like you don't want to be in as a seven. You want better than that. Michigan, Tom Izzo just said, we're sick of being nines. We got to get better seeds in order to get another Final Four run. The seed is a thing. I mean, yeah, you can be FAU, et cetera. I know, you know, Kevin Ollie won national title. I was in UConn a nine seed that year. It can happen. People are going to throw those things out, out at me as, as to come back off of this. But realistically, you want to have a good seed. So maybe he'll be in a better seed situation if he can get it done in the regular season at WVU than he would have at Drake. I mean, people always say the West Virginia program doesn't get the benefit that I'd ever on the football side. They do on the basketball side. Again, that's how they got in the tournament two years ago. They are treated as a historic program on the basketball side. So they get favorable situations. It's just, can you take advantage and, and, and actually be that? Yeah. It's part of it too. Yeah, and I think we we we've talked about Big Twelve physicality, but I think DeReeves also is going to have a similar style to a TJ Otzelberger at Iowa State, uh, kind of that Midwest uh, play style, which that which this I mean this is the first time DeReeves has ever left the Midwest. Uh, he's he was at Creighton since the beginning of the millennium. Well, so. I'll, I'll ask you that actually to transition here. Cause somebody brought this up earlier. I was going to get to it anyway. It, it, now the, it's a different era. So maybe it's not a big deal. We mentioned buying Tim would have been an easier cultural fit recruiting fit. Cause he's already recruiting the area and usually takes players. that West Virginia doesn't get or doesn't want to go down to JMU into that level. DeVries is looking at the whole other side of the country. So he's not looking at any similar player that a JMU would be looking at when you're a mid major. Is that an issue recruiting wise? Is that overblown in this era? Well, the fact that he's not even known, he may never have met these kids. He may not have went to the high school gym. He's not a cultural guy in this region from DC to Pittsburgh to Ohio, obviously West Virginia. Like, is that, you know, is that an issue at all for you? I, I think, I think it's a little overblown in today's era. Um, I think where West Virginia's recruiting base is, it's in such a unique spot where like they could target all these different they have regions. recruited all over they've recruited all yeah. over the place. You could yeah. go Ohio, you could go uh, Pittsburgh, you could go in state, you could go New Jersey, New York area, you could go DMV. Like they have so many different uh close go Philly. Go yeah, more Philly, go Philly than they've ever been. Yeah. There, there's just there's so many different re- like regions and hot spots near them. Um, and I don't think they're too far away from the Midwest, honestly, is like, yeah, the, I mean, he's out of the Midwest, but you, if you want to consider there's Ohio, people who think Pittsburgh is the Midwest, if you want to have that whole debate, by yeah. the way, that's a whole thing out there. So yeah, maybe. Yeah. So I, I don't, I think it's a little overblown. I do think, okay. I, I do, I do think there could be a, just adjusting kind of period of, Really figuring out, I, I think I honestly think a lot of coaches when they first start at West Virginia are, and, and I mean, Ren Baker's talked about it as AD. 
over time they learn like, wow, this is the fan base really, really cares here. Like I think yeah. even when they're hired, they underrate that. They yeah, don't I think really I think Neil it. Brown has hundred percent. I think that's the example. I think Neil Brown even admitted this. He I one hundred percent think he I think he underestimated the fan base when he got hired thinking, okay, historic program. They haven't really won a national title. They've done everything else. They'll be happy if I get bowls. And then he's like, wow, no, <laughs> there is a bar here. They are not. And so, so fair or unfair. I, I think he did underestimate the situation and how global the fan base is. You, you could argue it's a top 15, top 10 fan base in terms of how many fans exist yeah, around yeah. the world. And there's no there's no pro teams that like yeah. Neil Brown uh, hugs obviously recently they've been on this pedestal where they're the guys of that that represent the state this is the faces of the state especially when you look at athletics so I think it can be definitely overwhelming for somebody like Darren Dries who hasn't been familiar at all with yeah. West Virginia basketball I I think he can underestimate that. And it could be an overwhelming thing of, wow, I didn't realize I'm this important to the state. So Right, yeah. right. I mean, Ren's talked that's about another, that. I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd another, imagine they had some talks. Yeah. That's just yeah. another thing. It's just another thing I think the reason his staff are just going to take a little bit of time getting used to, especially yeah. just overall with the recruiting, uh, just in general. But that's just another aspect I think they could take some time really getting to know – what they got themselves into job wise. And Ren Baker has literally said this when he talked to us about what he looks for in coaches. And this is across the board of all programs is, are you somebody that has a personality that can handle being the head coach of a program at West Virginia? Because you are the face, not even really just sports. You're the face of the state, whether that's for better or worse. That's the situation. There's not a pro team. Yeah, they're close to Pittsburgh, but those are Pittsburgh teams. They're not in your state. There, There is a difference of the fan base. Let's face it, they would even agree. Southern West Virginia versus Northern West Virginia. There's an entire section that are close to Pittsburgh that are probably a similar vibe to Pittsburgh. There's a whole section that are totally opposite of anyone you would meet from Pittsburgh. And all of those people know you, care about you, are fans of the program. And if you j- drive anywhere within five hours, they will stop you and tell you what they think of you for better or worse. So can you handle that? You could absolutely argue there's more pressure of, of being the head coach of West Virginia, of any of the West Virginia teams, than if you are a head coach of a Cincinnati or a Pitt or a city school, because there is mm-hmm. a state school in there too. The head coach at Penn State and Ohio State is facing much more of that than Pitt and Cincinnati. And I'm not trying to throw darts at those programs. That's just the reality. The head coach at West, there's not even a a separate major. There's Marshall, but they're a group of five. You're Mm -hmm. the only power job, basketball or football, in the state. Those states have other power jobs there. You are you're trying to argue that your rival is another power who's 70 miles away from you, but they're in another state. You're the guy in your state. So that you got to be able to really, really handle that. I do think Neil Brown underestimated it. And I do think Darren DeVries and Neil Brown need to get together because I think Neil Brown is a resource that I would call him pretty quick and like, how did you handle this? What did you do wrong? And what advice could you give me? The only concern I, I will say, Ethan, is Neil Brown, which is why he was viewed as a slam dunk hire. People forget everyone loved that hire from rivals to WVU fans to national media, local media. That was that was well praised in 2019. And that was because even though he's not a West Virginia guy, he was a cultural fit from Kentucky and he knew the region. He had recruited the region. A lot of these people knew him already. That is not the case for Darren DeVries. So while you're dealing with the same thing Neil Brown had to deal with, with more pressure because you're replacing Huggins and even a more historic program you're taking over, but you also do not have the advantage of being a cultural fit or have any recruiting leg up of knowing any of these kids and having watched them in high school. That is a difference that I'm sure he's well aware, and I'm sure Ren and him have had multiple talks knowing Ren. I'm sure Ren basically probably could see the resume and do the analytics before they met. I would guess a lot of their conversation was Ren trying to say – do you really want this? 
you'll probably face a tougher job here than at Louisville or at other schools that are rumored to be interested in him. Again, Louisville, Kentucky is the pressure job, even though Louisville's won a national title. West Virginia, it's WVU. <laughs> There's yeah. no pressure at Marshall. I mean, again, not trying to throw darts there. That pressure is not like the pressure at West Virginia. Um, let me see. Let me see here. The hoops hype video had Stewart leave no doubt vibes. Dale, that is one hell of a comment there. Um, for Sean Mariner and those guys, uh, Joe Mitchin, I, I do love the digital team and the graphics team that they put together there, Ross Mara as well. But Stewart leave no doubt vibes. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> let's not. I mean, let's not go out of control. He, 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 the Reese does seem like he has a lot of energy. I'll, yeah, I, yeah. May, may, maybe he'll bring that energy too. I, maybe again, maybe, he might be a coach that people like rooting for. He'll bring that energy. Maybe he'll yell at a press conference or two. Maybe Ren liked that as well. They probably talked about some professional wrestling. I know they're both fans of it here. Um, and this is hard to say right now, Ethan. Any thoughts on? Either any of the assistants he's had already that likely could come with him, any other coaches around the country that you think, okay, could be a fit, a Dermar Johnson type of guy that we're talking about areas they have to recruit. Dermar's not coming back. He was brought in to recruit DC. Is there somebody else out there that, or is that still a plan that you would recommend that, okay, you don't, you don't have Dermar. You got to get a Dermar equivalent to, to be a former player to recruit the DMV. How would you staff this? Now you have a younger coach, not a Hall of Famer, not interim. You have a proven younger coach who has coached, who will not be learning on the job. He knows how to do this. He's been to tournaments. What kind of staff do you think is ideal around him? And what do you think his staff will probably look like based on what he had at, at Drake? Yeah, so he had three really main assistants at Drake and then two other assistants, obviously, in like a director of ops uh, recruiting roles. Um, I. I think it's going to be interesting how he gets – I think he's going to have to get a little creative with this. I don't know if it's going to be just as simple as everybody Everybody comes with him. Um, maybe it is like that. But I, I do think they need at least – now, we've talked about this. They they needed to turn the page from the Huggins era um, yeah, 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 and yeah, the yeah. Beeline era even, just, just kind of starting <laughs> a new era. Yeah. Uh, from the last 20 years. But at the same time, I do feel like they need somebody at least uh, to be a buffer. It, it, just kind of just uh, be able to tell them how this job is. Um, just kind of show them, show them around a little bit. You're and talking you, about like a former player? Because obviously yeah, they had a lot of those last year. You had, you had Butler, McCabe. Yeah. I mean, McCabe is one that I have heard some rumors he's not released a letter yet. Is there any chance of maybe him being brought back? The others are not. He hasn't released a letter. He's not yeah. hired anywhere else. Like, is that something that, like, just one of them, bring them back, just get him there? Yeah, is that that's that's important for you? Oh, I, th I think Jordan McCabe is, out of all the player assistants that they had, and this includes Deshaun Butler, who is Obviously. the best player West Virginia has had <laughs> in 20 years. Yeah, I think Jordan McCabe is the best player that the kids can relate to now. They grew up watching his mixtapes yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. Um, they saw him grow up as a media sensation. McCabe is the one that the kids know the most. Like out of Demar Johnson, Deshaun Butler, Alex Ruoff, who are all great players. Yeah, Dermo was drafted in the NBA in what yeah. two thousand two, like way long time ago. Those kids did not yeah. watch him play. Yeah, but they but they saw they saw McCabe grow up on YouTube on social media, yeah. And McCabe has that that Midwest Big Ten country. Uh, just he's from Wisconsin, so he's he's got he's he's close at least, and I and I could see him having that connection with, uh, with Dries being from Iowa, so yeah. Yeah, it, it would make sense for him. And I think they need a former player on staff. Um, but at the same time, they do need to turn that page and move on. So then who 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 are some former players, if you could think of any, that have no tie? Well, I guess it's hard to say no Huggins ties. He's been head the coach in 2007. But they were not on the previous staff. Yeah. Say, are there any that are that were not on the previous staff, even if they have a Huggins tie? 
that could actually yeah. make sense as somebody who's in the coaching ranks. We're not talking about, you know, Deuce McBride gets hurt and has to end his career as a player, and all of a sudden you're bringing him in. He's never coached. Is there somebody that actually this could make sense? Uh, to Frank, bring in? I, I think if uh, I think if West Virginia hired Dustin Kearns from App State, it would have been pretty easy to bring on Frank Young. He's a top assistant right. there at App State. I mean, I don't think he, I don't think he would leave App State uh, now, um, just being a lead assistant there. But that's one name I can think of that's that's uh, that's jumped up in the coaching ranks over the years. Um, but I, I'm just, I'm really set on, I'm, I'm really set on McCabe. I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, the stain I, isn't he, that much there. He hasn't been there that long. Honestly. He hasn't been there. He, he's young. Like he's got a lot to yeah. learn still, but. The kids can relate to him. He's he was able to get uh, Carmelo Atkins to come yeah. in. Like he has that connection with guys, um, and then when he when he can learn the ropes of really how to develop kids, really how to um, recruit uh, twelve months of the year, then then it really it could kick in. So yeah. it's going to be interesting to see what Dereez does. He could bring his he could bring most of his Drake staff with him, or he can mix a little bit with. Uh, with some former players from WVU or somebody brought up James Long, by the way, who obviously the yeah, best James, yeah. fans know, and that he has actually been coaching a lot of these kids, do know him well. He would obviously come with recommendations. It would be a major step up for him, but maybe not as an assistant. Maybe it could make sense as a low level assistant. It's not like you're giving him the head coach job. Yeah, James Long's doing a great job in his high school at uh, North Carolina, just won the state title this year. Right. So. Right. Um, he's he's doing a good job coaching. Would he want to do it? I mean, honestly, yeah. I mean, would he want to do that as a, yeah. Yeah. It, it, the the assistant support staff positioning is going to get interesting just based off of uh, just everybody that's been here for so long. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty clear a lot of these guys are gone, if not all of them. So Dereese could definitely get creative. He could he could reach out to guys that he's known in the college game for a long time. He could reach out to guys under the Dan Altman, Craig McDermott tree. Obviously, his guys at Drake, so he he can do a lot here. Yeah, yeah, and I would also imagine if you look again to how the football program has been kind of molded, even since Ren Baker got there. Since Ren Baker got there, they're hiring a director of football ops with NFL experience. I would not be surprised if you're if you're seeing now a director of ops added and i'm not talking about like a ron everhart i'm talking about maybe a legit guy that ren throws money at that oversees things more than what beeline you know supposedly was was doing with some conversations with eilert more than just a text or two that could be a thing mccabe would be something that i think would really really make sense if he's not brought back it would then just scream that they are just done with the huggins tree which would be unfortunate, uh, but and I think another program will scoop him up and he'll just take he'll be somewhere and McCabe's going to be fine. But I think if he was offered to stay, he probably would be fine to work for DeVries, even though he had a relationship with Eilert, of course. And I do think, and I don't mean this as a slight to Eilert at all, because he had a rough hand, did an admirable job, was a classy guy, and they might have won a few more games with Huggins, but that team probably wasn't going anywhere anyway. He admitted he was learning on the job which was the problem because the entire assistant staff was built to learn under a hall of famer, not under a coach who's learning on the job that had also never been a head coach before either. McKay might become a better assistant immediately in just one year or a month learning under a guy who's older, but not too, we're not talking 50 years older and he can maybe relate to, he might become more friends with the DeVries Closer in age to Eiler than him, and DeVries has the coaching experience. DeVries is not going to learn on the job. He knows how to do this. Wren wouldn't have hired him if, if he didn't. And if there's a question that McCabe has, instead of Eiler saying, well, I'll, I'll let you know in a week when I figure it out, he knows the answer right away. Like that it can make McCabe's job easier. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and by the way, for – for Brody, Jay already released his letter and no. 
to, to answer that about um, about Jay Hunt. So like he he is he is or Koontz, he is not coming back. But yeah, Butler and Demar Dermar Johnson, those maybe maybe Butler I guess could. I mean Dermar Johnson's not coming back. It's unlikely. I think McCabe's the one because he doesn't really have a stain on him. He's so so young, and he he can certainly still be molded there. Ethan Bach, Mike Oste here as we're talking, or live reaction to Darren DeVries being hired. By the Mountaineers, and as we close up shop, I've teased this a little bit, and we also talked about this already, but I forgot to bring it up again, so we're going to do it now. Tucker DeVries is the first player added. Let's face it, official or not, he's the first player added. He's coming with his father. He only has one year left, I believe, but he's an NBA prospect for many, which means he's getting shots. This may mean that they, lo they lose other players like Acrecia, but obviously Darren DeVries doesn't care. That's his son. He's coming. So that's a player that's going to be there. What kind of impact can he have? What do you know of him as a player? When people say Jay Wright said this, he's an NBA guy. Jay Wright also said the comment that that kid only was at a mid-major because of his dad, and he should have been at a power program last year, if not the year before. Do you agree with that assessment? And if that's true, you hear all of that, and I'll admit, not only myself as a journalist, but I would say even the casual fan probably would have light balls go off and say, if Jay Wright is true in everything he's saying, that is a kid that can get you in the tournament. Like that can bring other recruits in and that kid can score 20 a game and get you in the tournament and certainly swing four or five games they lost last year by himself. Is that the case? Yeah, I, I, I think especially, especially just, throughout the coaching search, I think it was impossible to figure out could West Virginia get a Jesse Edwards, Raekwon Battle, Kirk Creesa? Could they outbid and out-recruit these blue bloods for top transfers? Well, they're probably going to have a top 10 transfer with Tucker uh, DeRees. I, he's a back-to-back -back Missouri Valley Conference player of the year. Uh, he's averaged 21 points a season. So, and he – and unfortunately for West Virginia, he only has one year because he wasn't grandfathered yeah. in with the COVID, yeah. with the COVID yeah. year kids. But um, great player. He, it's it's a lot of he, he's gonna he's gonna have the ball in his hands a lot. Um, it's like kind of like that. I, I don't want to. I'm not gonna compare him to Luka Doncic, but just that tall guard, <laughs> yeah. just the tall guard, just the, the, yeah. the tall guard that can shoot on all three levels, uh, play make at the same time. Um, it's, it's going to be, he averaged seven threes, att like attempted per game. So it's going to be a lot of shooting. Um, it'll be different in the big 12 though. Will he get as many looks? Like, what would you translate I, if you I, have I, 21 in the Missouri Valley? Like, is he going to put 21 up in the big 12? I, I, yeah, I think he's that good. I just, I okay. think, I, I think it's with, with Jay that he really was only there because of his father and he should have been out of power. No, he, no, he's legit. I, I, you don't win. You you don't win yeah, a yeah, yeah. major player of the year twice. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> you're not good. But I I, th I think it, his numbers will also play a part in who else they bring if they if they kept Kirk Creesa uh, and then they brought a couple of the Drake guys. Yeah, his numbers are going to go down, especially in the Big Twelve. Yeah. Um, but if that if they identify him once he officially commits, if they identify him as the go-to score for the season, which it probably will be likely that he is. Then yeah, I, I think he's gonna. I don't. I really don't think his numbers take a hit going into the Big Twelve because they're going to be playing a different uh, or a similar style of offense to what they had at Drake. Yeah, and and Justin uh, Via here, if I pronounce that correctly, here in our chat brought up an interesting point. And if you're doing a sales pitch, I would probably say this: Kirk Reich has been open by saying that he feels he plays his best ball, and his teams are the best when he is a pass first point guard, and then adds in the sprinkles of scoring later. That's not what he did last year because they needed him to be the scorer. If that's true and he truly believes that, this could be an opportunity to do that. And maybe he would become that that pass for his point guard, get 10 assists a game, pass it off the Tucker tons, and maybe you'll still get 12 or 13 points instead of trying to score 20 on your own. Someone else will be the leading scorer. You'll sacrifice shots. You'll be in a better team, and you'll be able to be the pass for his point guard you've been talking about for years. So, yeah, throw that back at him. Yeah, yeah. he's – alluded to that like that is a great point there by justin to, to bring up and this might allow the team to fit and granted we could get off here and kirk could enter in the portal but i think the point of it is that bringing in a player like tucker even though you have a connection 
Like he was probably going to go wherever his father went. If his father took the Louisville yeah. job, he'd probably be with his father at Louisville. It's not like he's you know in love with West Virginia. But WVU is getting this two for one special here for a coupon here for one year, even though only one year of him. But other players may say, "Okay, you got a top ten transfer. I don't care why he's there. He's there. I want to play with him." That might bring West Virginia even more transfers. Yeah, we're on social media. That, I mean, it, you know, that's that's reality. Kid sees a program lighting up on social. That's what it was before the scandals, guys. The program was lighting up on social media with commits every day with top transfers. It made the other ones very excited and want to join, and they pulled the trigger on commitments prior to when they really were going to originally do it, and then it got blown up because of the scandals. That could happen now. You could see somebody commit tomorrow, uh, you know, or by Thursday. Once yeah, he it, gets there by having Tucker on board. One, one big part about – West Virginia's transfer portal recruiting the last two years is there's always been somebody um, just being that connection guy like Emmett yeah. Matthews with Eric Stevenson yeah. a couple years ago. Uh, they right. they also knew Joe Toussaint, Trey Mitchell, so that that flowered into that. Um, and then last season, Jose Perez, who ironically never played for West Virginia, helped recruit <laughs> helped recruit all of those transfers. He 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 hosted <laughs> he all of those yeah. visits. Uh, mm-hmm. He. He, he built relationships with Kirk Creesa, Jesse Edwards, Raekwon Battle, uh, a cook, a cook. He, he played yeah. uh, Academy ball with. So like that's, that's a huge thing in the transfer portal world is it's not just connections with coaches. It's not just all oh, this coach contacting me. It's connections with players as well. And a almost, lot of these guys. Almost more played, importantly. Yeah. 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 A lot of these guys have played AAU ball together. They've played in the same conference together. They've played in the same state together. They've ran uh, workouts together in the same uh, gym. So a lot of this has to do with connections. So, um, yeah, you could definitely yeah. see yeah. you could definitely see more guys. Maybe not specifically from Drake. I think I think there will be a couple other Drake kids that follow along. But yeah, you can't live there. This is Big Twelve basketball, right? You can't pluck the whole Drake roster. Yeah. But right. but I do think there could be guys in that area that transfer from other schools that could that could follow pursuit if they've, if they know Dereves, uh specifically Tucker. Yeah. And let's be real. We saw this with Toussaint going to Texas tech. Maybe Dereves even looks to players on the Iowa state roster that just had tons of success might say, okay, yeah, you did it big for one year, but come to a more historic program with me. You didn't want to go down. You like me, but you didn't want to go down the mid-major because you wanted to play Big 12 ball in Iowa. Cool. I'm in West Virginia now, and I already know you. You you turned me down when I was at a mid-major to play a, with a better conference. I'm in the Big 12. Like, come with me, and I we could go further. Tucker's not with me. He's with me. So, like, that – yeah, it's all about connections, and arguably – and you know, if you have a Hall of Fame coach, there are going to be – Eric Stevenson said this. There are going to be players – that do not even need anyone to text them, get a DM, like they don't care a tunnel vision, I will play for Hall of Famer, I don't care who else is there. Eric Stevenson said he, he was coming for Huggins, didn't matter. Before he loved West Virginia, he didn't even know about it, he was coming for Huggins. Yeah, West Virginia's not going to have that anymore. DeVry doesn't carry, you're not in the Basketball Hall of Fame, doesn't carry the cachet of Huggins. There are going to be people around the country that don't know who he is, even though he's had success. But if you start getting players, and if he gets his son into the NBA, and just look at the reaction too, Ethan, from Drake fans, they almost seem like they are. They knew the coach was going to eventually leave for a bigger job. They knew. Mm-hmm. They almost seem like the timing of this hurts them more to lose Tucker. Like I literally am seeing some of them said saying when he's in NBA in the NBA, this is going to suck that they're going to say from West Virginia instead of from Drake. He was with us yeah. for so long. Like they're going to lose that of him. It's almost like they're hurt more from losing that of him. That they, if they could just run out his eligibility and then lose Darren DeVries, that would have been fine with them. So to, to to see that, that tells you the player West Virginia is getting. I mean, there were even some that dropped the, and he's coming, but there were some that even dropped the comment of like, maybe he won't come because he just wants to get tons of points and maybe it's better for his career to not come, but he is coming. So, yeah, that's a major impact guy right away. Ethan Bach, Mike Oster here. As we close up shop, I will throw it back because there's still a lot of you in the chat. If you have anything else to say here, whether it's a question or a comment, I'll probably read it. Outside of that, Ethan, 
anything we haven't touched on in terms of reaction, in terms of impact, in terms of style of play, recruiting, coaching staff, Tucker DeFreeze, anything else here we didn't get to. We're obviously going to have tons more coverage as we go when the inter- introduction presser appears to be on Thursday. I'm pretty sure we hit everything. I just, I just think overall this is – I think West Virginia fans should be excited. Um, this is the first time – Really, in over 20 years, it's been a legit search. Yeah. Like Bob Huggins had that West Virginia connection. Right. Um, right. This is the first mid-major up-and-coming guy they've had since Beeline. So, yeah, I think West Virginia fans should be excited. This is probably the first time for a lot of West Virginia fans that have experienced this basketball coaching search. So, yeah. um, it's a new era. We'll see how it goes. I, I think I think West Virginia made the right hire. If you're going for consistency and uh, he's Dree's made tournament three times with the program, it's hard to win at. Um, yeah, he he doesn't have a round of 64 win, but that that comes with time. It just <laughs> seeing, seeing I can already see the wheels in motion that you're already like, that's gonna be the annoying comment that I'm gonna get back on everything I say. Oh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, there, there's it's, there's it's there's bad. certain things that people see. Uh, I, I like I. I think people kind of invest too much on the NCAA tournament success. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but like, like Dusty May getting the Michigan job uh, and being in talks with Ohio state Louisville, like he doesn't, I I really don't think he gets that if he doesn't make the final four last year. So it's, it's important in some ways, but it does not matter to West Virginia. If the, if the didn't win an NCAA tournament round of 64 game once. So, He's no, here no. now. He's gotten them to the tournament three times. Yeah. Uh, he's he has a great record. That's all you want to see. And if 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 he can build that program that Rem Baker wants, rather than building a team every year, uh, th- then I think you can start really get getting the wheels going and building that long term momentum that West Virginia really hasn't had in a few years. Yeah, and it's clear that Ren Baker wants to build a program, whether it be football, basketball, women's basketball, volleyball. The man wants to build programs, sustain success, program success that has happened at West Virginia in a myriad of sports throughout its history. So to do that, you need consistency. You need somebody who has the fire in his belly that's not 70 years old, that is of age to do this with you. Someone that he's going to relate to, someone that players are going to relate to. You bring an NBA prospect with you, that's certainly a great coup for you as well. I think this fits culturally. I think it fits personality-wise. I think the fans are going to like watching the team in terms of exciting brand of basketball and maybe him as a coach. And this does start a new era for sure. And I was going to ask you actually to close up shop here what the reasonable expectations can be. I'll save it because I don't think that we can really speak on it now. We It's hard to know what the roster is even going to look like. But – Realistically, if you're if you're expecting to win a conference title in year one of anybody, that probably is unreasonable, guys. But West Virginia does not care if he won an NCAA tournament game prior to getting to West Virginia. Admittedly, Ren Baker and the fans will start caring after you get several years into this without an NCAA tournament win at West Virginia. But there's no reason to believe he cannot win one at West Virginia and win multiple at West Virginia. And I will close it with this, that I think this actually is perfect. So... Justin again, and obviously it's reality, regardless of how it ended and nobody wanted wanted it to end this way. And yeah, this is somebody taking over for Josh Eiler, but he's really replacing the Huggins era. Huggins was still around. We'll see how often he's around now for, for Darren DeVries. There's no Huggins guys there right now that there are always going to be people that are going to say like to start a tenure. Last time West Virginia did a coaching search, they got a Hall of Famer. Yeah, he was coming home, but three years in, they will go to the Final Four. Like, three years in, we go, I don't want to just win a tournament game. I get it. Those people are always going to exist. They're always going to say that you could have just brought Huggins back and then the Eric Stevenson of the world would come for Huggins and maybe they would go further next year just for Huggins. Maybe there'd be more money invested just for Huggins to buy him a natty. That was the thing a year or so ago. There, those people will always exist. And Justin here admits he was one of them, but now says... I am a Huggins guy still. I also still think this is the best hire Ren and W could have possibly made in today's NBA basketball era. And then let's go. So that's where we are now. Like this is the coach. 
you could wish Huggins ended differently. Huggins would wish it ended differently. This isn't anyone else's opinion other than the fact everybody wishes it would have ended differently. If it didn't happen, if one scandal happened, if the other one didn't happen, maybe he'd still be there. But in reality, it's now Darren DeVries. Eilert was there. Props to him. It didn't work out. This is now a new era. And anybody who wanted it, here it is. This is a perfect fit if you have to bring somebody in in this situation. And it was never going to be Huggins. So we will see. That, that'll be the <laughs> – we will we will see here what happens as Ethan Bach and I – yeah, I think we touched on everything we possibly could touch on here in this live reaction broadcast. The rest of our coverage, Ethan's analysis, et cetera, is at WV Sports now. Any final word, Ethan? Uh, no. I, I Like you said, I think we touched on everything. I think – I think like I said, I think the fans should be excited, and uh, I'm excited to see what Doris says this week and is when they yeah. announce the uh, – introductory press conference yeah i think it's gonna be a little different of a vibe than when eilert was officially handed the keys as the interim i mean this this should this should be national attention some excitement there we'll see if he drops the bomb of you know i'm, I'm here to win a national championship or if he uh, screams and, and does a rick flair woo or or if it's maybe more calm cool collected We'll see, because I think Ren's here for all of it. So whatever he wants to do, Ren's probably going to sign off on. So, uh, I, yeah, it's going to be appointment television there on Thursday when we, when we do get that that new era officially kicked off. And you can just see the reaction around the country to this. Again, West Virginia coming off the very worst season in program history managed to get their guy that they wanted all along and beat out other programs that arguably are in better spots right now. Doesn't happen if there's not a reason. So maybe people saying that there's still reason for optimism for this program actually know what they're talking about, even though, admittedly, it's been really, really bad this past year. And there's always room to be the Iowa States of the world, to be the Baylors of the world, to be the program of the world that comes out of nowhere. That can happen as well when you have an NBA prospect. So Ethan Bach, Mike Ostier, that'll do it for this live reaction broadcast of Darren DeVries now hired by the Mountaineers, the 23rd head coach in the history of the WU basketball program. He will replace interim Josh Allard and the tenure of Bob Huggins. Now take over the Mountaineers coming off the worst season, but where will the future go for the Mountaineers? That'll be the question that everyone's waiting to find out about.